Hey guys, welcome back to my channel, and if you're new to my channel, hello, my name is Gabby, and welcome. So today's video is about a case that is requested by a subscriber named Madison B. So thank you, Madison, for requesting this case because I mostly focus on vintage cases and I had never stumbled across this one before. I'm going to go into a little bit of the backstory of the incident that is connected to this case and then get into the case itself. So with all that being said, let's just get right into it. There have been a few videos on my channel where I have briefly discussed fires that have been caused by unknown reasons. We don't know how the fire started, but out of all the ones that I've talked about, this is the one that took the most lives, and that is the Hartford Circus Fire. Back in the day, a typical circus was held under a huge canvas called a big top, and the circus would travel from town to town by train. The Ringling Brothers and Barnum and & Bailey Circus was the circus, known as the largest and most over-the-top out there. Going to this circus when it was in town was a tradition for many families around the country. It could hold over 9,000 people around its three rings. Now the tent's canvas needed to be waterproof, and their waterproofing method was to cover it in paraffin wax and gasoline. The idea of going to the circus was definitely pushed a lot in the late 1800s, early 1900s, but especially during war times when a war was going on because it was definitely something that got people's minds off the fact that war was going on and their loved ones were away. And this case has to do with the 1940s, 1944, and that's when obviously World War II was going on. Also because World War II was going on, there was a shortage of workers and equipment when it came to the circus, so that did cause some issues at times. There was actually a previous fire in 1942 when it came to Ringling Brothers, but that fire mostly took the lives of animals in the circus. It was nothing compared to the tragedy that would occur two years later. When it comes to circus superstitions, being late and missing a show is very bad luck. When the Ringling Brothers and Barnum and & Bailey Circus arrived in Hartford, Connecticut on July 5th, 1944, they were so late they canceled one of their two shows for the day. And because of this, many of the people working for the circus were on edge the entire day. They had a feeling something may happen at any moment. They were unfortunately right, but it didn't happen until the next day on Thursday, July 6th. Everything at the beginning of the day surprisingly was going as planned. There were really no issues with anything mechanically and everybody had showed up to work. Everything was running smoothly even though the workers were kind of on edge the entire day. Because most of the men were away at war at this time, women and children made up most of the crowd and after the lions performed a small fire started the band leader a man named merle evans saw that the fire had started and he wanted to keep the crowd calm because he thought the fire would be put out very quickly so he directed the band to play stars and stripes forever but the fire did not get put out that easily when they realized it wasn't going to be put out so easily they started directing the crowd to leave the tent through the exits most were able to leave the tent unharmed, but not all. Some got caught up in the hysteria, some didn't leave the tent and instead ran around it trying to find their family members or friends. Some even stayed in their seats thinking it would eventually be taken care of and the show would continue. The only animals in the tent at the time were the lions, who were put in their cages when the fire broke out, and the two cages blocked two of the exits, which made it impossible for some to exit the tent. The tent itself finally collapsed about 8 to 10 minutes into the fire. The fire took the lives of estimated 168 people and injured about 700. It would be known by many as the day clowns cried. Here's one first-hand account of the fire from actor Charles Nelson Riley, who was 13 at the time. I remember somebody yelling and seeing a big ball of fire near the top of the tent and this ball of fire just got bigger and bigger and bigger. By that time, everybody was panicking. The exit was blocked with the cages that the animals were brought in and out with, and there was a man taking kids and flinging them up and over that cage to get them out. 
I was sitting up in the bleachers and jumped down. I was three quarters of the way up. You jumped down and it was all straw underneath. There was a young man, a kid, and he had a pocket knife. And he slit the tent, took my arm, and pulled me out. Still to this day, all these years later, really we don't know how the fire started. Some believe that it was just a tossed cigarette and some believe that it was arson. It's still a mystery, but it is not the only mystery surrounding this entire story. There were many victims when it came to this fire, but one of them, definitely the best known, was a young girl with beautiful blonde hair wearing a little white dress. She was given the name Little Miss 1565, named 1565 because of the number assigned to her at the morgue. This little girl ultimately died because of asphyxiation and her body was surprisingly well preserved with few burns. This little girl was unclaimed by anyone and her identity would remain a mystery for many decades to come and some believe still to this day. She was buried in the Northwood Cemetery in Wilson, Connecticut near a victim's memorial. If you go to any search engine on the internet and you search up the Hartford Circus Fire, you are obviously going to come across photos of the fire itself, but one of the most popular photos is this little girl's post-mortem photo. If you are a subscriber of mine for a while, you know that I do not include any post-mortem photos on my channel because obviously some people do not want to see it, some people are very triggered by it, but if you want to look it up for informative purposes, it can be found with a simple Google search. The two men who dedicated most of their lives to trying to figure out the mystery were Detective Thomas C. Barber and Detective Ed Lowe of the Hartford Police Department. They took photos of her body, took fingerprints and footprints and dental charts of her teeth. They also put in the work to make sure her story was publicized nationwide. They visited orphanages, welfare agencies, and sent her photo to every primary school in Connecticut. Until their deaths, both would put flowers on her grave every Christmas, Memorial Day, and anniversary of the fire on July 6th. After they both passed away, a local flower shop continued the tradition. Through the years, there have been tons and tons of theories when it comes to who this little girl possibly was, and by definition, she has been identified as somebody but a lot of people do not believe that that person that she was identified as is actually her. So technically, it is still up for debate. In 1981, Ed Lowe's widow told the press that they had tracked down her family years before and they didn't want any publicity surrounding it, so they kept the huge breakthrough in the case to themselves. Was this true or was she just trying to finally lay the mystery to rest? Six years later, strange notes started popping up in the cemetery where Little Miss 1565 was buried. One note left on her gravestone read, Sarah Graham is her name, 7632, date of birth, six years, twin. Other notes nearby claimed she had family, including her twin, buried close by in the cemetery who also passed away in the fire. In 1991, arson investigator Rick Davey concluded in his book, A Matter of Degree, The Hartford Circus Fire and Mystery of Little Miss 1565, that Little Miss 1565 was Eleanor Emily Cook of Southampton, Massachusetts. He came to this conclusion with the help of Eleanor's brother, Donald. As the story goes, Eleanor Emily Cook had attended the circus that day on July 6th, 1944, with her mother and two brothers, Donald and Edward. Her mother, Mildred Cook, was badly burned from the fire and in the following months was not able to persevere in the search for locating her daughter due to her injuries. At the time, she was not convinced Little Miss 1565 was her daughter. However, years later, Donald formed his own opinion of it and thought she could in fact be his sister. In 1991, the theory was believed so much that they exhumed the body of Little Miss 1565 and moved her to a cemetery in Southampton, Massachusetts, where she was buried in the Cook family plot alongside Eleanor's brother, Edward, who also perished in the fire. Ten years later, author Stuart O'Nan published his own book, basically completely going against this theory. 
In his book, The Circus Fire, A True Story of an American Tragedy, he tells how Eleanor Emily Cook's dental records did not match that of Little Miss 1565's, and also how Eleanor's mother, her entire rest of her life until she passed away herself in 1997 at the age of 91, claimed the child was not her daughter. At the end of his book, he says, to be lost and forgotten, to be abandoned, is a shared and terrible fear. Just as our fondest hope as we grow older is that we might leave some part of us behind in the hearts of those we love and in that way live on. Perhaps in the end, we will not be lost. In that respect, she was received the only gift we can give her, a gift we wish desperately for our loved ones, a gift we all want, finally, to be remembered. Many members of Eleanor's family believed and still believe in Stuart Onan's claim that Little Miss 1565 is not their Eleanor. I'm pretty sure Little Miss 1565 was cremated, so doing a DNA test is kind of out of the question. If you do look at photos of Eleanor Emily Cook while she was alive, because there's quite a few online, and compare them to the post-mortem photo of Little Miss 1565, there are quite a few differences. You do have to take into consideration that a body going through as much heat as a fire can cause it to look a little bit different, but in my opinion and a lot of other people's opinions, the main difference is the ears. The ears are very, very different. But of course, if you are able to look at the postmortem photo of Little Miss 1565 and photos of Eleanor, that's up for you to decide the differences or if you do think that they look very similar you can go online and compare the two if you can stomach a postmortem photo and if you can definitely let me know your thoughts down below in the comments out of everyone who died in the fire there were two women one man and two children who were unfortunately burned beyond recognition and Eleanor's mother, Mildred Cook, believed that her daughter was one of the two children. Stuart Onan himself believes that possibly Eleanor's body was mistakenly identified by another family thinking it was their daughter, but Eleanor's family still to this day is working with police to try to finally solve this entire thing. The location of where the fire took place all those years ago is currently the location of a memorial for the victims. Many survivors of the fire visit the location every year on its anniversary, while others choose to never return to it. Many survivors went through years and years of therapy after the event just to get through their trauma. Ringling Brothers and Barnum and & Bailey held their final show in Hartford, Connecticut on April 30th, 2017 during their final tour. So the mystery of Little Miss 1565 is technically solved, but not really because there's basically no proof to back it up, so you can form your own opinion. If you are interested in learning more about this case, I will have all my sources linked down below in the description of this video, and also I will include the name of the two books that I mentioned in this video as well, so you guys can do your own little bit of research. People always ask me my personal opinions when it comes to the cases that I discuss on my channel because I am the one who researched them and you all are interested, so if I'm being completely honest with you guys, Looking at the postmortem photo of Little Miss 1565 and photos of Eleanor Emily Cook, there are just a lot of differences. And like I stated before, the ears are the main thing. If you look at the two photos, you're going to see exactly what I mean. I'm not saying it's not her, I'm just saying there are a lot of differences. If Little Miss 1565 is not Eleanor, it's possible that her parents also tragically died in the fire as well and that's why she was never identified but then also you have to think that wouldn't other family members come forward after seeing the postmortem photo and say oh that was my niece or that was my little cousin i feel like somebody would have come forward eventually it's just all very odd and confusing but when it comes to how the fire originally started in rick davies book because he was an arson expert he said that the theory about it possibly being started by a tossed cigarette has to be false because a tossed cigarette can only cause a fire if the humidity level is less than 32. And that day in Hartford, Connecticut, it was in the low 40s. And that's one reason why most people do lean towards it possibly being arson. 
In 1950, a man named Robert Dale S. of Circleville, Ohio claimed he was the one who started the fire, several other fires, and even murders since his youth. He confessed to a lot. In November of that year, he was arrested for unrelated arson charges and was sentenced to 44 years in prison because of it. Police had their suspicions when it came to him being responsible for the Hartford Circus Fire because for one, he had a past of mental illnesses and two, he could not prove he was anywhere in the state of Connecticut during the Hartford Circus Fire. He did pass away in 1997, but in a 1994 interview, he stated that he made up the entire thing and he was not responsible. So, possibly he was responsible, possibly he wasn't. It's unknown, and again, that's up for you guys to form your own opinions. Even though decades and decades have passed since this incident occurred, some people still hold hope that we will one, figure out how this fire started, and two, find out Little Miss 1565's true identity. It is extremely, extremely rare that a case this old finally gets solved, but it's not impossible. So, like I said, leave your opinions down below. I'd love to hear what you guys come up with. You all come up with ideas that I haven't even come across online and come up with theories that I didn't even think about myself. So, definitely leave all your ideas down below in the comments because I'm going to be reading through all those throughout the day after this video is uploaded. And of course, like always, leave any more requests for video ideas down below also. And before I go, if you've made it this far in the video, I wanted to give a small shout out to somebody who really, really, really deserves it. And that is my true crime YouTube friend, Joshua Miles. I rarely give shout outs on my channel because I don't want to distract from the cases themselves, but he really deserves it. He started his channel not long ago. He told me that I was one of the inspirations for him starting his channel to begin with. He's such a sweet person and he puts so much work into his videos and he deserves so many more subscribers. So please go check out his channel, give him a follow, tell him I sent you, and I will see you guys in my next video. Bye guys.